the family of the silicate minerals. And right now we're in Roman numeral four, underneath silicates, now going into systematic mineralogy of each of the subdivisions. And we're starting off with the nesosilicates. It's 438 to 444 in the textbook as an introduction to this family. And then 484 to 497 to get details on the systematic mineralogy of all the different important minerals. We're not going to go through all of them. We're just going to go through four of them here, and we're going to start off with the shared properties. The shared properties are primarily controlled by that one isolated SiO4. And so we're going to start off with that, that this is an isolated SiO4 4 minus tetrahedra. All right, that's the definition of the NISO, the island silicate, so tetrahedron. And, but it, of course, has to be bonded to something. It's not just hanging out in space, but it is bonded to cations. Bonded to cations. And m many of these, um, well, you can tell me what each of these cations are, right? Probably most of them are in the form of an octahedron or have that octahedral arrangement with oxygens. Now, in the textbook, sometimes these octahedral ones are called M sites. We're not going to do that really for this class because I think it's a little bit beyond the scope, but you may see that in a textbook. The other shared property here is because the, the bonds are equal strength in all directions because it's just SiO4 bonded to octahedron, the, the strength is equal in all directions. And that does not allow there to be this uh, preferential weakness in the, that takes the form of cleavage. So instead what we get here is that we say fracture is more important than cleavage because bond strength tends to be equal in all directions. Bond strength equal in all directions. All right, so those are some things we should expect to find in all the nesosilicates. And now let's just go into our first one. And the one to start with is arguably the most important, and that is olivine. Although I will say there are so many important nesosilicates. The chemical formula for olivine is MgFe2SiO4. And we go to mineralogy next. And the place to start with the mineralogy is actually with this right here. And what this means is that there's a solid solution possible in these octahedral sites between magnesium and iron. And this is very, very important for the olivine family, really. In fact, let's go, let's say this. So solid solution in octahedral sites. And this can be a complete solid solution where we have one end member that would be 100% iron, and then there's another end member that would be 100% magnesium. And the one that's 100% magnesium is called forsterite, and the one that's 100% iron is called phaolite. And this one is super important. In fact, when we think about olivine in general, when we use the word olivine, this is the one that we're talking about, forsterite. So I want you to have these two interchangeable in your vocabulary. As it turns out, most forsterite or most olivine on the planet is actually somewhere right around here because this is what the composition is of the Earth's upper, upper mantle. The rock type peridotite is composed of forsterite. That's like we would say FO90, uh, what number do you want to put here? 92? And that means it has phalite 8, which means the solid solution is there. So that's a very important aspect of olivine. We should show you some pictures, shouldn't we? Yeah, well, let's get some color in this lecture. So here's some good images of olivine, and they allow us to talk about some other aspects of olivine's crystallography. One is that there's going to be shades of green. Shades of green is going to be the primary color that we're going to look for when we deal with olivine. Yes, browns and yellows are possible, but most of the time it's shades of green. Most students in mineralogy classes across the country learn the little rhyme where olivine is olive green, and it's not actually olive green, but it certainly is green. Another thing to talk about is that it is orthorhombic, and so orthorhombic prisms would be something to look for if olivine grows euhedral. And we do see one of those right here. In fact, when we see this shape, we call it a lantern, a nice lantern-shaped prism. But 
this is much less common than anhedral crystals. Okay, so I'm just going to star anhedral. That's where or how I see it preserved most of the time when I'm looking at rocks. Another thing we see in this picture here is how it breaks, and it breaks with a conchoidal fracture. Breaks with fracture. Those are the important aspects of mineralogy. Uh, we have always put in the hardness, so the hardness is about so let's see, the hardness is about a 6.5, and the density, or we could say specific gravity, this is in the upper threes. All right, that is our mineralogy of olivine, and the geology of olivine is actually super fascinating to get into as well. So these are our geologic occurrences. And I guess I'm going to go ahead and put in a picture first, and then we'll use this picture to discuss our geologic occurrences of olivine. The two thing, so these are our two primary occurrences of olivine. One, as is a phenocryst inside of uh, mafic rocks that's shown in this picture. These are phenocrysts of olivine within a basalt. And then in this picture, we see a mantle xenolith where there's a chunk of the Earth's upper mantle, a rock type called peridotite, that is composed of 90% olivine. And we got to write both of those things down here. But the main reaction that controls the geology of olivine is actually a chemical reaction where Mg2SiO4 plus quartz SiO2 has to react to form a mineral called enstatite, which is MgSiO3. And because of this relationship right here, there's a rule that we can say, and that is that olivine and quartz never occur together. So we can say olivine and quartz never, ooh, I wrote that in all caps, never occurs together. And it's because of this reaction. If it's a, if it's a rock type that has a lot of SiO2 in it, well then it'll absorb all the olivine, the forstritic olivine, and create a rock that has encetite plus quartz. If it's a system without much quartz, but a lot of olivine, all the quartz will get converted to encetite, and you'll have a rock with encetite plus olivine. So this is the reaction that guides our geology. And so the type of rocks we end up getting is there, it can occur in mafic igneous rocks. And by mafic, I mean very low SiO2, very high iron, very high magnesium. And then it will also occur in the peridotite, peridotite upper mantle is greater than 90% forsterite. And that's your symbol for forsterite. It's an F and an O. And yeah, this is, of course, what we talked about already. Olivine and forsterite tend to be interchangeable with one another. If you're dealing with phthalite, you always say phthalite because it's the not the norm. And then there's one other type of neat geologic occurrence. And we're not going to talk about it too much here, but it is in palisite meteorites. And those are beautiful meteorites. The last thing to say about the geology in particular with respect to mafic igneous rocks and peridotite is that we're going to do this. We're going to put a star and we're going to say that alters readily in presence of water. OH. And what it'll do is it will convert itself to a mineral called serpentine. This is a this is a mineral with huge amounts of tectonic uh, significance. Let me introduce it to you for the first time right now. Here is a thin section that was at one time olivine. And all of this right here, that was an olivine. This is olivine, but water started to percolate along grain boundaries, entering into the crystal, and then it started to uh, just corrode the rock and alter the rock into a rock composed of serpentine, where serpentine is this, uh, we can say this yellowish color. More about serpentine later in the semester. So then what I want to do is we got time for one more mineral. Let's go ahead and talk about zircon. This is going to be, so that was B, this will be big C. Zircon is a fascinating and very important geologic mineral. The chemical formula is ZrSiO4. We'll put in a picture here of zircon before we get started. I guess we got a sketch of how its crystal habit should be. And then here's a beautiful example showing a tetragonal bipyramid like shown here. Other types of 
prisms and bipyramids are also possible. So under zircon, let's go one and we'll say mineralogy. And we might as well hit this note that we just said, which is that it is tetragonal. Tetragonal. And we expect there to be prisms and uh, bipyramids or dipyramids. I don't care the word choice there. Dipyramids. They mean the same thing. Our hardness here is very hard. It's a hardness of 7.5. And it has a specific gravity that's very dense. It's a specific gravity of 4. 0.7. So that's going to speak to one of its geologic occurrences, right? It's going to be a detrital grain because it's great, got great survivability and will enrich itself in placer deposits. Now one of the other very important aspects of zircon is its ability to substitute uranium in for uh, zirconium. So we're going to say uranium may substitute, in fact, not just may, like basically always substitutes for ZR in lattice. And the important thing about uranium is that uranium will decay. And this is a topic that's so important in geology. And uranium decays to lead via radioactive um, breakdown. So uranium to lead, radioactive decay. And this process has a time scale associated with it. And so we can count the amount of parent to the amount of daughter. And if I'm going a little too fast here, that's okay. This is a topic for another day, maybe even another class. But the general thing is that we take a parent that's radioactive and it will decay to a daughter. And it does this with something called a half-life. And that's the time it takes for one half of the daughter of the parent to decay to a daughter. And so if you can go in with a machine and count the amount of uranium and count the amount of lead instead of a zircon, you can actually put an age on the rock. And so sometimes we call this um, we call this clocks in rocks. And this is the biggest significance of zircon in the geologic uh, community and that we can take a zircon crystal like this here and analyze its uranium analyze its lead and figure out how long ago this zircon crystallized so this this clock and rock means age of crystallization and this science revolutionized our understanding of the planet our solar system because we were able to say oh the earth is 4.6 billion years old and the and this plate tectonic event happened here, and this volcano eruption erupted at this age. That's all because of zircon and clocks and rocks. One thing that it can also do, this is kind of a little an aside, is that it can create a metamict mineral. Or no, we're going to call it a metamict crystal. And using the word crystal, I'm going to put in parentheses, because this uranium, uranium to lead decay, this... Um, will destroy the crystal lattice. This is a destroyed crystal lattice. And sometimes you'll hear about a metamict mineral. And anytime you hear about metamict mineral now, this is your opportunity to remember that it is a crystal lattice destroyed by radioactive decay. It's kind of like suicide in that it is self-done. That maybe is a little macabre as an example. I did not practice that before delivering this lecture. All right, let's finish up zircon. The geology of zircon. Beyond this like significance, where does it actually occur in the rock record? I'll start with a picture. Here is an example. And this is, would be an example in an igneous or metamorphic rock. It occurs as an accessory mineral. Accessory mineral. And so this is obviously not just a rock. This is a thin section of a rock. And this right here is our zircon crystal. And it is undergoing radioactive decay and is creating this halo in the biotite crystal that's surrounding it. You see how it's extra brown and it's kind of like got a gradient to it? Well, that's because the uranium is decaying to lead and is causing metamitization of the biotite crystal. Pretty neat to see that happen in there. Something I recommend you look for when you are looking at thin sections later in your career. The other geology of this, besides as an accessory mineral, is that it can be important in detrital settings because of its hardness and density. 
and I realized there's a one picture I did not yet put in. We better put it in right now. And this was keyed into the idea of uranium to lead decay. People will come in and try to put an age on a rock. Like in this study, they put 2.7 billion years old, or that's the same thing as saying 2,767 million years old, where they're analyzing, or in this case, they're analyzing two different places within the same crystal. You can see growth rings of this beautiful bipyramid of of zircon where there's one age in the interior that is two million years older than at the exterior giving you some idea about how fast the crystals grow oh and there's just some more neat views of tiny little zircon crystals all right see you next time when we finish up nisosilicates